Anyway, it was, so you have to hold that information and then um, go back, carry that task out, and then just remember those multiple directions. So that's the kid who often either raises her hand and asks again, or just doesn't do anything, or may look at their neighbor's work to see what they're doing, which is a good, good strategy. So, uh, and also working memory interferes with self-monitoring when you're, when you're doing tests. Self-monitoring means as you're doing something, are you talking to yourself and saying things like, oh wait, am I doing this correctly? You know, am I following the directions that I was given at the, as given at the beginning of the lesson as they're doing it? So it's being able to hold the task demands in mind as you're doing it. Because sometimes I've tested kids before who will start, you know, on a, like an IQ measure and I will give them the directions and they'll run through uh, several items and then all of a sudden they'll start doing it differently. Uh, for example, if I'm asking them to choose one picture from each line that uh, has something in common categorically. So here's three rows of pictures. You have to choose one from, you know, just, you have to come up, first of all, it's a reasoning task. But then sometimes in the midst of the task, they'll just start choosing two pictures in one line and another in a second line, and they think they've done it correctly. So I think that's partly working memory. They, they lost track of the task. Of course, I always just say, no, remember one from each row. But they seem to just lose the task demands. So that's what self-monitoring is, is being able to hold in mind what it is I have to do as I'm doing it, and am I doing it correctly? And you're talking to yourself and saying, no, wait, am I, okay, no, I, just, I have to do this. I need to go back and make sure I did that. So being able to just keep that information going. Um, okay. Of course, you you know having to keep in mind and keep in mind information while thinking of other things can certainly uh, you know takes a lot of effort and you can make errors and forget what you were supposed to do or lose your place or even if you're writing uh, you can omit words or sentences uh, when you're writing because you're not constantly thinking about. You're not being able to simultaneously think about what you want to say as you're writing it. And so, really, one of the effects that working memory has on learning is that it, uh, uh, it helps integrate stored knowledge with info that you're, uh, just this temporary stuff that, that's coming in. So as you're, as you're uh, learning something new or being presented with something new, you're constantly pulling things from long-term memory to make it meaningful. You're, you're connecting it. You know, if they introduce something new, you're thinking, oh yeah, that relates to... But often what happens is kids have difficulty, uh, first of all, holding the information that's been presented, so they have trouble making that connection between long-term storage and short-term working memory. So that just it disrupts their learning. Um, so it's disrupted because of the working demands of individual learning episodes. So you can think about it if you're teaching, well, even if you're just teaching phonic rules and you know you don't have good working memory uh, from what you've just been taught a moment ago about a sound combination like CH and then the task moves on to another, uh, you know, the next word and you haven't really retained that long enough to apply it. And that can interfere with phonics instruction, learning basic math facts, learning spelling rules, learning everything, really. So, working memory is a predictor of academic success, and this is from the Teach ADHD website. And, you know, it shows that uh, children who have higher scores on working memory achieve better test scores generally on achievement scores than, than other students. And it's associated with reading comprehension. And of course, when you think about a reading comprehension task, if you are trying to answer a question, um, or if you're looking for a piece of information, um, as, as you start reading, a student's work, if they have poor working memory, they may forget what the information is they're looking for as they, once they start reading. So they may have to go back and reread, and, or they may have to go back and read the question again. 
So being able to hold information or keep information online while you do something with it. And, you know, I think there, again, I, I indicated some how it can interfere with um, writing tasks. And, of course, you can see that writing is probably the hardest thing. I'm sure there's lots of teachers here who may feel this way, that writing is about the hardest thing you can ask a kid to do. And they're having to hold in mind a lot of different little tasks or uh, you know, a lot of skills as they're doing something. So, first of all, what they want to say uh, and how they want to say it and make sure they use good grammatical usage and word order and, of course, you know, the spelling part of it and the capitalization part. Um, and, of course, the purpose of the text or who the audience is. So this play places a high load on working memory, and that's why you see a lot of kids who have um, working memory and ADHD, they have a terrible time with writing tasks because it requires you to integrate so much into that act. Of course, if you are automatic in a lot of these things, if you've written a lot of sentences and you have great spelling and you have, um, you understand capitalization and punctuation and it's just automatic, then you can write much more easily. In fact, that's that's one way to uh, to you know compensate for some of these working memory things is to practice and practice and become more automatic. Uh, or if you're a slow writer, you know it's like if you're a slow writer, then you learn to type. But anyway, these are um, writing is the hardest thing you can ask a kid to do, and if you have working memory problems, it's going to make it. Extremely hard, and of course, when it gets, you know, again, getting back to the math side of it, you're being asked to do several things whenever you uh, have to solve, especially story problems, and um, so, you know, just being able to, as I said before, rule out information that's not meaningful, and then being able to apply those strategies, and know that even though you may have completed one step you may have more steps to complete. I see it all the time where I test kids and it's a multi, it's maybe a three-step problem and they give me the answer after the first step. And then it may be interest on a TV set that costs $500 and they'll say, okay, let's see, $1,000. You know, or some, you know, something that will be uh, not reasonable. And I look at them like, now really, I don't say it, but I give them this look that says, do you really think that? And, you know, they think, yeah, that's my answer. So uh, they kind of, they're not self-monitoring either uh, whenever they're trying to problem solve. Um, so again, here are other implications, and uh, you can see it can affect a lot of different things. Following directions, uh, reflecting on your actions, monitoring how you're doing on something. Of course, it, it interferes with these kinds of specific academic tasks, math facts and spelling words and dates and uh, paraphrasing, making it hard to paraphrase if they read something, asking them to just paraphrase or summarize what they've read. It's hard because they have difficulty holding it in mind after they've read it. And of course, we've talked about organizing essays. Now, I have to say there is some repetition in uh, in what I'm presenting because I elaborated on it without going back and double checking, okay? So, <laughs> that way you'll really get it in your memory. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so it just keeps information on mine and online and, uh, but it's not just retaining something or memorizing something for a moment, it's having to manipulate information. That's why it's called working memory. Uh, and. And of course, it helps you stay on task and block out distractions. And so it's kind of a temporary workspace. It's like you've heard of the cloud, where you can pay for this service and you can feed stuff in your computer and it's in the cloud somewhere and then you can pull it down. Have you heard that, that expression, the cloud? It's kind of like that, except that's kind of long-term memory, really. But, uh, and as I said before, it has a small capacity. You can hold about four elements of new information at one time. Uh, one article I read said you hold more letters than numbers in working memory. I don't know, I guess you, that would be useful like 
if you were trying to, you know, I don't know, I can't think of, maybe trying to remember how to spell something right off the bat. But, uh, unless you really rehearse it, then it's usually gone in about 20 seconds. And as I said before, there's this continuous transfer from uh, long-term memory uh, to working memory. And that's what makes new information meaningful, is being able to uh, pull up things that you already know and, and attach some meaning.